Quetzalcoatlus was a genus of large pterosaur, or flying reptiles. They lived during the late Cretaceous period and consisted of two known species, Quetzalcoatlus northropi and Quetzalcoatlus lawson. Their wingspan has been estimated between 10 and 11 meters, or 33 to 36 feet, and standing on their back two legs, their shoulders would have reached heights of 3 meters, almost 10 feet. They have a reputation for being the largest flying animal ever to have lived. But could they survive nowadays? Having a giant flying reptile soaring in our skies certainly wouldn't go unnoticed in our modern world. Quetzalcoatlus was most common in what is now known as Texas. There have been a large number of fossils found there, but there is still debate about the lifestyle of these gigantic creatures. Some scientists have predicted that the pterosaurs were scavengers, mostly feeding like today's marabou storks. Any carcasses that littered the open plains would have been available for the Quetzalcoatlus to take advantage of. However, a more recent analysis of Quetzalcoatlus's feeding behavior suggests that their beak wasn't built for ripping meat from a dead animal in the same way that vultures are. It lacked the essential hook at the end of it, and the beak didn't seem to close completely either. Instead, it was suggested by some that these flying reptiles skimmed the surface of the oceans, catching fish in their enormous beaks. But again, this idea was dismissed. Due to the energy efficiency for their size, they would have created too much drag. Not only that, but their fossils have only been found hundreds of miles from the nearest coastline, and with no evidence of fresh waterways nearby. Now, the general consensus is that Quetzalcoatlus hunted small vertebrates on the open plains. They were adapted at walking on all fours, using their forelimbs just like a four-legged mammal does today. It was unusual in that its wings folded to create its forelimbs, which were the same length as its back legs. This made it efficient at walking, and less cumbersome than some of the smaller pterosaurs. Furthermore, they could turn their heads 180 degrees, which helped them to keep an eye out for predators whilst stalking their own prey. Today, the open plains of North America would provide a similar habitat for Quetzalcoatlus. Although mammals were small during the Cretaceous, and the flying reptiles would likely have fed upon terrestrial reptiles, today, the Quetzalcoatlus would have more prey choice. They could pluck the likes of marmots, hares, rabbits, and chipmunks from the long grass. Ground-nesting birds could also be considered prey, as well as some reptiles that the Quetzalcoatlus would be used to feeding on. Their feeding behavior has been likened, by some, to that of egrets and herons. If the Quetzalcoatlus found inland water, then it may slowly stalk through swamps and still fresh water and grab unsuspecting fish from just below the surface. Today, the largest flying birds in the world include the wandering albatross, the Andean vulture, and the Cenarius vulture, but even they would be dwarfed by the Quetzalcoatlus. If the Quetzalcoatlus took to the skies, it would dominate the skyscape. However, it would unlikely compete with these others for food. Wandering albatrosses fish the open oceans for their prey, whilst the Andean and Cenarius vultures are primarily carrion feeders. Despite their impressive flying capabilities with some scientists predicting they were able to reach speeds of 80 miles per hour and fly non-stop for more than a week, they needed to land to find their food. Although it is now believed that the giant Quetzalcoatlus didn't skim the oceans hunting for fish, some pterosaurs did and were snatched out of the sky by large predatory fish and sharks. On the ground, Quetzalcoatlus was likely targeted by some of the carnivorous dinosaurs of the late Cretaceous. In North America, these were mostly the famous T. rex and less well-known gorgosaurs. Further north in Canada, a formidable predator was Albertosaurus. And to the south of Argentina were the predatory Gigantosaurus and Carnotaurus, which likely would not have crossed paths with Quetzalcoatlus. Today, having size on their side, would make the Quetzalcoatlus difficult to target for many predators. Of the larger predators that live in North America nowadays, brown and black bears are the most likely to be able to take down a Quetzalcoatlus. Smaller mountain lions, wolves, and coyotes probably wouldn't be large enough to cope with a full-grown Quetzalcoatlus. However, hunting in packs could make them a formidable presence. If the flying reptiles walked through North America's swamps, then they could also be the target of alligators and American crocodiles. Although Quetzalcoatlus are considered predators, they would likely have less of an impact on the ecosystem today than introducing other prehistoric reptiles. They would be less likely to compete for the top spot amongst North America's apex predators. 
it is not known whether they were territorial, but they probably wouldn't fight off any bears that came close to their hunting grounds, as they were not adapted to fight in the same way that some of the carnivorous dinosaurs were. Feeding on small vertebrates, like rodents and rabbits, may impact other species like foxes and coyotes that rely on them as a large part of their diet. However, these smaller prey species are typically numerous and tend to bounce back from shortfalls in their populations. If Quetzalcoatlus turned to preying on fish, then they could pose a problem for North American bears. Seeing both grizzlies and Quetzalcoatlus peering over the edge of a waterfall during the salmon run could be quite a sight. If food was abundant, such as when salmon come to the rivers to spawn, bears would be less likely to chase away Quetzalcoatlus. However, if prey was scarce, then there is more likely to be interspecies conflict. Although the smaller pterosaurs were thought to live in flocks like some wading birds, it is believed that the Quetzalcoatlus was primarily solitary, therefore it would pose less of a threat to the likes of bears if a particular food source was being fought over. The Quetzalcoatlus's habitat was thought to be open plains. They would have struggled to take off in heavily forested areas. By the late Cretaceous, flowering plants had emerged and grasses were growing across North America. Before this, the landscape was dominated by fir trees and ginkgos. Today, there are plenty of grasslands across North America, with the Great Plains covering around 500,000 square miles. This would provide the food, in the form of small vertebrates, that Quetzalcoatlus would feed on. It was believed that Quetzalcoatlus didn't run along the ground to take off. Its enormous wings would have got in the way of that. Instead, it seemed that they used their powerful and muscular back legs to leap into the air. They then flapped their wings to climb into the sky. They had immensely powerful chest muscles and flexible wings, which gave them stability during turbulence and allowed them to soar at great heights and over great distances. Today, they could cover a wide area relatively quickly, meaning that they could be widespread across North America if they could find means to survive. Although they would be an impressive sight, the size of Quetzalcoatlus may not be favorable in today's modern world. Could the enormous size of Quetzalcoatlus be its downfall? During the late Cretaceous period, the Earth saw one of the largest animals ever to have existed. This was when the largest sauropods, called the Titanosaurs, roamed the Earth. It is not fully understood why the dinosaurs as well as the likes of the Quetzalcoatlus were so enormous during this time. Some believe that it was because of the gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Others believe that it was an evolutionary arms race between predators and prey. If Quetzalcoatlus lived today, where animals are nowhere near as large as they were 66 million years ago, they may change over time to adapt to the modern ecosystem. Not only is the atmosphere different with different compositions of gases, but there aren't so many large predators to compete with. As we saw with more recent extinction events, like the extinction of the megafauna from North and South America, 10 to 50,000 years ago, animals have turned towards being smaller in size. Being so large means that an individual requires more energy and food to survive. Finding enough prey today in a world that is dominated by humans with ever-shrinking natural habitats could mean that there is less for Quetzalcoatlus to eat. Also, with relatively few predators considered big enough and bold enough to prey on Quetzalcoatlus, they may not need to be so enormous. So, what do you think? Do you think Quetzalcoatlus could survive nowadays? Leave a comment to argue your opinion. That's all for today. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. You can also leave a comment with what you would like to see in the following videos. Thanks for watching. See you next time.